It was just another day at the Jones's farmhouse in Northampton. Master Splinter was preparing a cup of tea when he sensed a presence. That shadowy presence was none other than the Rat King. However, Master Splinter had another pressing concern. After years of confronting various foes, he was finally defeated. Not by an enemy, but by a heart attack. Or was it truly a heart attack? Could there have been another cause of death? Might he have been poisoned? The most pressing question was, why was the Rat King there in the first place? Well, to find that answer, today I'll be talking about the mystery of the original Rat King. The character was brought to life by Jim Lawson and debuted in Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Volume 1, Number 4. Jim Lawson revealed that the character was inspired by the Leatherman, a mysterious vagabond who roamed a consistent 365 mile loop between the Connecticut and Hudson Rivers in New England from around 1856 to 1889. This loop took him approximately 34 days to complete, regardless of weather conditions. The name Leatherman was attributed to him due to his distinctive handmade leather attire, which was pieced together from leather patches, extending from his hat to his shoes, including the bag he carried. Known for his limited communication, he could convey his thoughts through simple, broken English monosyllabic words, gestures, and occasional French terms. After his death, a French prayer book was discovered on him, suggesting his francophone roots. Despite his aloof demeanor, he was benign. Many locals eagerly awaited his visits, some even leaving food on their doorsteps for him. The leather man used to live in caves and huts along his route. It was in one of these caves in Mount Pleasant, New York, where he died in 1889 of mouth cancer likely a consequence of his tobacco use. Many rumors exist about this mysterious vagabond. He was even given names at some point, but it's perhaps because of how little we know about him that he became a unique and lasting figure in New England folklore. This is perhaps why Jim Lawson and Peter Laird tried to keep the original Rat King a complete enigma over the years. This inspiration can be seen not only in the patch suit that the Rat King often wears, but also in the hermit nature of the character. Next up would be the inspiration for the name of the character. Although it should be noted that the character was first known as Monster, even at the end of his first appearance, he called himself the Rat King. This name would stick by the time the character was adapted into the toy line and the animated series. But historically speaking, a Rat King was a rare phenomenon in which multiple rats would become intertwined at their tails. Once connected, they would move and live as a unit. Rat kings have been used symbolically in various literature and art forms to represent chaos, decay, or the unnatural. And speaking of decay, for the inspiration behind his first appearance in the story, I, Monster, Ryan Brown explained that it came from his memories of an old, eerie, abandoned factory in his Cleveland neighborhood. A forsaken place that, at night, felt like it was looking back at you. After moving to Massachusetts, Brown found himself once again living beside a similarly creepy abandoned factory. The Rat King's debut had him narrating his own story. He shared that he formerly inhabited the swamps, but he relocated to an abandoned industrial park as temperatures dipped. One day he noticed the turtles and Casey Jones trespassing in his territory. He overheard Michelangelo saying that the place was haunted and that he wished ghosts were real. Recognizing that they were alluding to him, the Rat King reflected on how people previously mistook him for a ghost before rebranding him as a monster. Given his self-perception as a ghastly creature, he felt kinship only with rats. Because to him, the only thing the rats feared was the light. After seeing the monster-like anatomy of the turtles, Rat King feared that these monsters were coming to take his place, his turf. So he knocked Mikey out and tied him to a piece of wood. Mikey would eventually free himself, just in time to fight an incoming wave of hungry rats. This was when he was finally found by his brothers and Casey. The Rat King made them follow him to a silo, which was a trap to leave them at the mercy of the rats. Seeing that there were no exits, Mikey created one. Once out of danger, Leonardo looked up and threw a shuriken at the Rat King. The Rat King fell to his apparent death but the story's last panel would be of him next to his only friends, the rats. The story might leave you with more questions than answers. 
such as what's the nature of the Rat King's relationship with Splinter. The depth of their connection became evident in the City at War storyline. Here, Splinter, seemingly compelled by fate, ventured out to the Forsaken Industrial Park. This exploration led him to fracture his right leg in two places. In shock, losing blood, and unable to move, he did what he could to fix his leg. But by doing so, he fainted from the pain. After realizing that it would take him some time to heal well enough to climb out of the silo, he had no choice but to stay there, at the mercy of the cold weather and the lack of food and water. As the days passed, Splinter would hear a voice guiding him through his options. This presence was none other than the Rat King. Splinter managed to gather rainwater to drink, but after a while, he realized he wouldn't survive without food. The Rat King, who seemed to be there most of the time, would suggest Splinter eat some rats. Because in his dire situation, if he didn't start eating them, they would eventually eat him. Thinking of himself to evolve from a rat to do such a thing, Splinter refused to surrender to the darkness of brute necessity. This infuriated the Rat King. The way he saw it, he either took a detour from his quest for a higher level of existence, or his quest would end there. In desperation, Splinter had no choice but to kill a rat and eat it. But thanks to this, Splinter survived in the silo for two months. The nature of the situation was revealed as some kind of test. For Splinter to understand that his beliefs were sometimes so strict, they were like walls erected in his mind, blocking out the light of knowledge. And the Rat King had been waiting for him to arrive, for a long time. By the time Splinter healed enough to leave the industrial park, he searched for the Rat King to thank him for the knowledge. But instead, he found his skeletal remains. The Rat King had been dead for a long time from Leonardo's shuriken in the subsequent fall. Yes, this story was the inspiration for that episode of the 2012 series. In any case, Splinter was finally able to climb back to freedom. But what happened there? Was the Rat King truly a specter or just a figment of Splinter's imagination? Well, in his next appearance in Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Volume 2, Number 65, by Dan Berger, he acted as a spirit again. The story took place in the farmhouse, and judging by the Age of Shadow, it could be placed between Volumes 2 and 4. It was a Christmas night when Splinter received the haunting visit of the Rat King, warning him of impending danger. This danger was an Ice Oni created by Mamoru, a man who fell out of grace with the Foot Clan for stealing money from them. Looking for a way to sustain his family, Mamoru accepted a job from the Oroku family to kill the turtles and avenge Saki. Mamoru invoked Ice Onis to attack the turtles, but Splinter quickly figured out how to defeat them. As a result, Mamoru was killed by a ball of fire. In the end, the Rat King visited the place of death of Mamoru, touched a flower that died rapidly, and then he disappeared. Does this mean that the Rat King was dead at the moment of Splinter's death? That question would be answered in Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Volume 2, Number 35. In this story, written by Steve Murphy and penciled by Chris Allen, the concept of the Pantheon was introduced. It took place in an otherworldly realm. There, a deity of the rats waited too long to find his successor. In a desperate move, he visited Earth and passed his mantle to a young man who was running away from custody at a hospital. Predictably, this man wasn't a proper fit for the role, indulging in personal vices and neglecting all the rats whose existence was put into his care. One day, the Rat King noticed the existence of Splinter and took him to his realm. But this didn't work as the Rat King had expected. Splinter was able to use his astral form in this place and learned about how he came to be. Splinter then had pity on him and offered to teach him how to govern his own impulses. But the Rat King didn't take this kindly accusing him of thinking himself better than others. This weakness the Rat King described is the lesson Splinter would be tested for in City at War, which supposedly happened after this adventure. The Rat King gained control over Splinter, but was interrupted by the rest of the Pantheon. In this version of the Pantheon, there were deities for bears, eagles, bats, wolves, cats, deer, owls, rabbits, and raccoons. The Cat Queen woke Splinter from the spell and explained to him that the Pantheon watched over the lives and souls of those they protected. 
Splinter was curious as to what the plans were for the Rat King. The Cat Queen explained that it depended on Splinter's answer to her question, whether he wanted to become the new King of Rats or not. Knowing that the Rat King would die, Splinter rejected the proposal. The Cat Queen let Splinter go but told him that he would have one more chance to become the King of Rats, and that final opportunity would present itself at the very moment of his death. This takes us back to the event of Splinter's death, when the Rat King would return to Splinter to allow him to become the King of Rats. This is why I assume the Rat King was present in the farmhouse. But there was a twist. In the last issue, so far, of TMNT, Volume 4, Number 32, a mutated Raphael ran into a tiny Donatello, living inside a robot next to a mindless clone of Splinter. You probably have some questions about what I just said, but let's focus on Splinter for this video. It turned out that Donatello wanted to create a clone of Splinter to analyze if there were other reasons why he died, going back to the theory that perhaps he was poisoned. As frustrating as this was, Splinter died of natural causes. But Donnie noticed a discrepancy in Splinter's genetic makeup. When he compared it to a sample of Splinter's DNA he had from a previous point in time, he concluded that the Splinter that died wasn't the same Splinter that raised them. So, this is how it seems to have happened. The Rat King met a Splinter at some point, and after being defeated, his deity role was offered to the mutated rat. This splinter was the one that died, not the one from City at War. We could assume that the Rat King was dethroned and returned to our realm without his powers, since this is how the Turtles met him. The Rat King died in that only confrontation with the Turtles. Then the real splinter met the ghost of the Rat King during the events of City at War. The next event would be the Christmas story with the Ice Oni, but it's hard to tell which splinter this was. I assume this was the same Splinter from City at War. The origin of the other Splinter, the one that died, was never explained. All we know is that he wasn't the original, and fans speculate he wasn't the one who fell in that silo in the events of City at War. The final appearance for both characters was in TMNT Volume 4 Number 10, in that somber scene at the farmhouse that spawned this video. As frustrating as this mystery may feel, it was Peter Laird's intention to let the Rat King's nature remain ambiguous. Since Volume 4 took more than a decade to land the twist around Splinter's doppelganger, it's possible that Steve Murphy wasn't aware of this plot twist when he wrote the Pantheon story. Something I'll probably mention again in a future video about other versions of the Rat King. In any case, despite the character's mysterious nature, Kevin and Peter wanted him to be in the 1991 sequel to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Since they planned on adapting the Baxter Stockman story with the Mousers, a rat-heavy plot, this was an excellent opportunity to introduce the character. But as you already know, that pitch didn't materialize. I know, you came in with questions about the Rat King and ended up with even more questions about Splinter. Maybe someday we'll get these answers. But in the meantime, we can imagine that the splinter that died became the new Rat King. Leave your theories and questions in the comments. And don't worry, there will be videos about the other versions of this character. Thanks for watching!